Worshipping the chain, hoping fame and I expire to his name. Tell a pipe down, need to stay in his lane. Cause these bitches still choosy in their ways. All natural are weaving up their braids. But let little mama look fly, it's on the day. Nigga trying to check me on my shoe game. That was back in high school, roast the ass up, full so name, name brand. Got a stage. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of Justice in All Black the video podcast series of the Africana Studies Department at UNC Charlotte. Hi, I'm Crystal Edens. I'll be your co-host along with uh, Oscar De La Torre. And today we're talking with uh, Dr. Akeen Ogundarin. Uh, Dr. Ogundarin is Chancellor's Professor and Professor of Africana Studies, Anthropology and History at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte where he also serves as chair, where he served as chair of the Africana Studies Department from 2008 until 2018. He previously taught in the Department of History at Florida International University and served as director of the institution's New African New World Studies. Uh, he, his teaching career began in Nigeria, where he taught at the University of Benin, among other locations. Dr. Gundaran's research interests broadly focus on the archaeology of emergent communities, social complexity, and cultural history in the Yoruba world. His earlier research efforts sought to understand the, the impacts of global and regional social, political, and economic processes on community formations and how social actors created knowledge, communities, and identities with objects and the landscape. Ogundaran is currently leading a research project on the political economy and settlement ecology of the Oyo Empire, focusing on the landscape history of the empire's metropolitan area, Oyo Ile, and one of its colonies, Ire Ile. He has also facilitated collaborative projects on the archaeology of Atlantic Africa and the African diaspora. In addition, he has written on the historiography of Black intellectual thought, social sustainability, and cultural heritage issues. Uh, Dr. Gundaran has authored, edit, edited, and co-edited several publications, including Archaeology, History in the Ilare dist District from 1200 until 1900, uh, which was a part of the Cambridge monography, uh, monograph and African archaeology series a book on pre-colonial Nigeria from 2005. He published Archaeology of the Atlantic Africa and the African Diaspora in 2007 with Indiana University Press, Power and Landscape in Atlantic West Africa in 2012 with Cambridge University Press, and Materialities of Ritual in the Black Atlantic in 2014 with Indiana Press which also won a choice outstanding academic title for 2015. And his latest book, which we'll be discussing today is The Yoruba, A, a New History. So Akeen, uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, congratulations on becoming the uh, UNC Charlotte Chancellor Professor uh, along with your new book. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your personal trajectory in archeology span and how you arrived to this moment. Thank you very, very much, my great colleagues, uh, Crystal and uh, Oscar. I'm really delighted to be with you. And I want to thank you for taking the initiative to begin this uh, podcast, Justice in Black. Uh, it's a great service to the Department of Africana Studies, also a great service to Black studies in general. So thank you very much. Well, I, my trajectory, like any, any person of my background, um, I grew up in Nigeria. I grew up in a very traditional environment. Uh, traditional, but at the same time, uh, in the context of colonial modernity, so that we all knew that the only way for forward is was to master Western thought go to school and, and, and become someone in life you know, because the, the old way was no longer giving us the, the asset. 
to flourish. So I grew up in an environment whereby people talk a lot about history. They, they use history to solve conflict. They use history to, to energize. Everything's about history, Every, everything. So I actually wanted to do something else. I wanted to be an astronaut, uh, <laughs> but you know, my thesis was not that good. So I, I ended up, uh, but I love literature. I enjoy literature. I enjoy history. So something told me that follow your passion. I didn't have anyone advising me to do this. So when I applied to study in the university, I, was, I, I applied to study history. In those days, in the British system, up to now in Nigeria, you, are, you apply to the university for what you want to study. And once you get in, it's difficult to change that major. So my, my major was history. But within my first month in college, they established a new department of archaeology. So I, I felt, oh, this is new. Archaeology is about studying the past. OK, I will do it. So I changed my major right there and became and because they did not have any student, they were looking for students. So they just took me. I was one of the first five students who joined that uh, first set of, uh, of programs. So, but my background as an archaeologist, I mean, being trained in archaeology means that my professors emphasize interdisciplinary approach. They say that you cannot be a, a good archaeologist if you cannot, if you do not understand the oral traditions, the living traditions of the people, the culture. So I did a lot of field work in the community. I did a lot of, horror, I, mean, I studied under great scholars on horror traditions. I also excavated. So my background is very interdisciplinary. So I did my master, my BA, my master's in Nigeria. And then I realized that I did not have, my professors cannot teach me anything new. So I started applying outside in Nigeria. I gained admission to Cambridge University. I gained admission to Boston University, but Boston University gave me more money than Cambridge, and I did not have money to go outside Nigeria to study. So I, but also American, I like American system better than British because in the US PhD program, I knew I would be learning new theories. I, I would be grounded in, in theories, you know, in the, in the anthropological approach to archaeology. So that encouraged me to come to the US. And uh, so that I've always seen myself as that person at the inter, at the, intersection of disciplines that, that I, I, I'm interested in the pre-colonial African history and you cannot do that very well if you are not well trained in archaeology, in uh, historiography, even in historical linguistics, as well as historical ethnography. So these have always been my, my, my tools uh, for understanding African history. So that is my how I, I, I ended up. So now, my first job, to the surprise of many people, was not in anthropology. It was in history, because that is the way I see myself all along, that I'm an historian. I just happen to be using archaeology <laughs> to study history. That's, that's what it means. So and luckily for me, uh, Florida International University bought it. They said, oh, OK, we like this kind of guy. <laughs> because I can easily talk to medievalists. I can really talk to classicists. I mean, we we use the same language, and I believe that even LA European uh, scholars as well. I can really talk to them because I did comparative history, I did comparative civilization. So I can really talk to scholars who do ancient history. So that's how I ended up at International University, and when the opportunity arrived to 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 lead the uh, African Studies Department at USC Charlotte. Again, it's a, great, it's a great blessing for me to, to be here. So that is my trajectory. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, again, you know, congratulations. And, you know, we're happy to have you. I'm sure, you know, FIU is pretty happy to have you as well. Um, but your, your new book on the Yoruba uh, has been getting some really um, great reviews and there's a lot of anticipation it seems around the kind of interdisciplinary scholarship that you're doing. Um, and so we see that upcoming, there's, there's gonna be some events surrounding, you know, talking about and discussing the book. Um, it'll be the subject of 
uh, highlights on the fifth annual Lego Studies Association Conference it coming yes. up in 2021. Yes. And it looks like there's going to be a special edition of the Europa Studies Journal uh, surrounding the new book. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about it and, and how you came up with the idea for it? Yes, thank you very much for that question again. Uh, this book, I've been writing it in my head for many years. When I finished my PhD, I studied a very local area. You know, history is local. I mean, that's what it is. You have to study a particular place at a particular time. <laughs> but as historians, we, we are always interested in the broad questions, right? The broad questions that inform that local subject. So my work was, was, was focusing on the questions of regional interaction and cultural formation between 1200 and 1900 in a particular area of Yoruba region. So I, after that dissertation in 2000, I wanted to write this kind of book. Then I realized that that was too ambitious. So I didn't have the data for it. I thought my little data will be sufficient. I didn't know that's not working. So I ended up just revising my dissertation and just publishing the way it is. Then, because I was doing, a, I was in a program, and the PhD program in Atlantic Civilization at Florida International University, that's the focus of my PhD program. My work gradually moved more towards so that I can communicate with my colleagues and train students. My work moved more to Atlant early modern period, 1500 to 1850. So over, over so, for many years, that's I mean, even up to now, my work has focused more on that in terms of my, in, in terms of my primary research. Then, but this book has always been in the back of, this kind of book has always been in the back of my mind as I work, as I do my research. So I, I had the, the privilege to receive the National Humanities Center Fellowship in 2014. I, I applied there to write, because now I have massive amount of data to work on the impact of the Atlantic economy on Yoruba culture. That was the book, that was the focus of my fellowship work. So when I and I've been writing chapters in drafts, so when I got there, I realized that I cannot just start from 1500. I should provide a background, you know, like a background about what was happening before the Portuguese arrived on the coast. I should explain what was happening. And as, as I was trying to do that, again, I realized that, no, this is not the right approach to write this book. I need to really get back to what I wanted to do in 2000. And now that I, because I've, I, I've had a lot of data over the years that I've been collecting. So, so instead of writing two books, so I was thinking that I will write two books. I will write one, 1500 to 1900, then I will go back and write another one covering uh, from the beginning of time to 1500. And I said, no, 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 let me just write one book because the, the danger is, I mean, no, I mean, write the, the first one and never get to the second one. So, and also I realized that in the process of writing my book, I realized that there are certain ideas in Yoruba historiography that have become canonical. We don't challenge them. What we do is we basically fit in what we are discovering, the new archival data, the new archaeological data, we simply fit them, fit them into existing paradigm. Mm. And I became uncomfortable with that, that no, 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 we need a total paradigm shift in the way we conceptualize. Now, in 2001, I actually created the first periodization scheme for Yoruba history. I published that in 2001. So in which I said that the idea of looking at African history in a very tripartite way, pre-colonial, colonial, post-colonial, post this, this doesn't reflect the experience of the people. There is time before European appearance. So let's go, let me re redefine our periodization. So using that periodization scheme that I developed, which was also well received by scholars, I then say, okay, I can go all the way back. To, uh, to, to the beginning of Yoruba cultural history, which is about 300 BC. And, 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 and then I began to collaborate with my other colleagues in historical linguistics 
to to really write what I think is is an important book that will be a contribution to Yoruba historiography. So the the book has had many layers in my in my thinking. You know, there are many layers, and uh, which requires me to do different kinds of research over the years. So uh, and and so in a way. This, this kind of book has always been at the back of my mind, but I realized that it is not the kind of book I can go out and say, okay, I want to do a research on the book. So what I did was to break the idea of the book into different parts throughout my career. So everything that I worked on, this book, this kind of book has always been at the back of my mind. And this, that this data, although I can write uh, other books, I can write uh, articles, but eventually, the data will be used to write this kind of book. So in a way, I, I, I segmented my research activities over the years into different parts. So I can tell you that oh, I've been writing this book for the past five years. You can say I can, I've been writing it for the past 10 years. You can say I've been writing it for the past 20 years. <laughs> and none of, I mean, all of them are true. It's just that different phase of the project requires different activities, you know, so. So in a way, uh, this is your life book, we could say, or at least one that condenses uh, and that reflects on all the work you've done uh, uh, over your trajectory. And I found it very interesting and very telling. And also we have to say for our audience and for the readers of the book, the book, by the way, is this one so that everyone can see it. <laughs> that's a beautiful book uh, thank you um so i found it really interesting that for a book that in a way condenses and presents uh, your reflections about your uh, subject of study and the archaeology you've practiced and written about for many years you chose the con a concept to designate the yoruba which is the concept of community of practice Mm -hmm. uh, you said we shouldn't, it would be insufficient to talk about a linguistic group. It would be insufficient to talk about an ethnic group. It mm -hmm. would be Eurocentric to talk about a nation. Mm -hmm. Instead, uh, the work I have been doing and the discussion I practice here is framed around the concept of a community of practice, right? Yes. Uh, what... Uh, Tell us about that concept, please, how you came to it and why you, what you mean by it. Yeah, thank you. See, when we, we, there's something we call decolonization, right? The need to decolonize African historiography. I've, I've been part of that dialogue. I've written about it. I've, I've recommended what, what we should be doing, how to decolonize African history. And but that decolonization requires epistemological delinking from Western colonial historiography. And that the linking must start from the kind of language we use, the kind of sociological concepts that are borrowed. So when modern anthropology started, right? Or let me say when anthropology as a field started, of course, Africa is one of the places where it started because Europe was trying to understand colonized people. <laughs> about their culture. And the tendency is therefore to think that the colonized people did not have any history before Europeans showed up on the, on the ground. And they see culture as static, as, as something that is static, fixed. Now, Europe brought a very, a very European approach. Sorry exactly. for interrupting, but yes. a very European approach, right? So Europe brought uh, the idea of nation, the, the idea of nation state to Africa and other colonized places. And the version of that for the colonized people will be tribes, right? You are, tri you are a tribe, or in, 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 among the Yoruba, you're a tribe. In, in, in Germany, you're a nation. They are, they are the same, basically. It's just a matter of geography. That, you know, <laughs> nation in Europe, tribe in Africa. The, in between, you have ethnicity. Now, this concept presupposes Banded cultures and banded time, that the culture is banded, they do not pay attention to the fluidity of African conception 
of identity that when Europeans arrived on the ground, many Africans were multilingual, especially cosmopolitan cultures like the Yoruba, like the Mande, who were trading 1,000 kilometers from their home. You know, they were exchanging, exchanging goods for more than a thousand years. So these were, and, and therefore, being, being a Yoruba is more than biology. So in my book, I say that, you know, for me, so I was looking for the right word to use to describe who the Yoruba are it, based on their history, based on their about like 2000 history. And I, I didn't find ethnicity. Ethnicity works within the Nigerian concept. Ethnicity works for the Yoruba in Togo or in Benin Republic. But it doesn't capture who the Yoruba ancestors were. That's not the way they saw themselves. There were non-speaking Yoruba who became Yoruba over time because of interaction. So I came, then I used this new concept. It's not new, it's that been around for a while in anthropology, community of practice, which, which says that, which I applied to the case of the Yoruba, but it, it means that people become, so it, it allows me to explore the process of becoming. And that process of becoming is a process of learning. That, 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 that culture, cultural identity is a, product, is a product of socialization, is a product of learning, is also an open, it creates an openness for us to explore the, the network of overlapping interaction that constituted and also reconstituted the Yoruba over a very long period of time. So that concept allows me to explore the interactions between the Yoruba speaking peoples and non-speaking non-Yoruba speaking peoples who adopted Yoruba epistemology. So you don't have to be a, 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 a Yoruba speaking person to become Yoruba. That is why when you look go into the diaspora, for example, let's say in the Americas, being a Yoruba is not a racial identity. Right? Whereas colonial historiography assumes and forces us to think of the Yoruba as a racial and biological group. Mm -hmm. So I want, I want to be true, true, uh, truthful to the way Yoruba conceptualize who they are, that you can be Caucasian and be a Yoruba in as much as you learn what it means to be Yoruba and you adopt the epistemology of the Orisha, of their religious system cosmogony and so in as much as you embody and you live that culture the Yoruba believe that you are a Yoruba that is what makes a German woman Susan Wenger to go to Nigeria in 1958 and became a Yoruba and had a very long impact in Osogo another place where I have excavated so this kind of intercultural communication is very important to understand African identity so that is why I use that concept, community of practice. A community of people, uh, a community of overlapping communities <laughs> that subscribe to a set of practices, a set of worldviews, a set of uh, beliefs. To me, that is uh, what the Yoruba are. Along with this one, so, uh, I find the operation that you did uh, trying to understand the Yoruba community of practice in itself and by itself, of course, in communication with other uh, cultures and societies that were in its spaces around it and in the Atlantic world later on, right? Yes. But along with that, so you make an effort to try to uh, put truly some of the concepts that have been important in Yoruba history at the center of this Yoruba community of practice. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, the concept of ile, the house, which mm -hmm. not only means house physically, but mm -hmm. it also means a seat of power, it can yes. mean a city, it can mean a political entity, it can mean a cultural entity. Mm -hmm. um, Tell us why this concept lies at the very heart and the core of the Yoruba community of practice across history, please. Thank you. Um, every community of practice has its sociology. 
because it, it, it is that sociology that allows them to communicate. Despite internal differences, they subscribe to certain principles. So, so this book is also a conceptual issue of the Yoruba, and, 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 and I'm trying to do something that is, tends to be missing in African historiography. See, when we look at, when we talk about Africa, we, we tend to focus, especially in the historical sense, on questions about migrations, trade, you know, political systems. We usually don't pause to ask, what are the principles that guided the people, that guided their, their aspirations? What are the meanings? How did they create meanings? How did they, what, what made life meaningful for them? So we don't do much about intellectual history of African society before European arrival, so that uh, it is as if history just moved on without people having any purpose in their life. That is a major problem in African history because we don't apply African concept to interrogate African historical experience. Mm -hmm. So what I was trying to do here, therefore, is to bring these sociological and epistemological concepts to place them at the center of, of unraveling Yoruba history. So in, in the book, I argue that there are four principles, I mean, sociological principles that are important for us to understand not just Yoruba history in Africa, but the manifestations of the Yoruba in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. The first one is Ile. So as I have in the book that the Yoruba belong to what Levi Strauss calls house society. This is the core of their social organization. So in the book, I have the reason why is that the Yoruba originated about 300 BC. I mean, they, the language has been existing for about maybe 5,000 BC. Uh, we call it a proto yoruboid language. It's not exactly the same language we speak today, but it is an ancient language like that. So, but around 300 BC, they began to migrate from a very tiny part of niger Benue confluence in Nigeria. So one of the things I address in this book is how come that this very tiny group of people <laughs> You know, just one of many living around Niger Bimbo country. How did it happen that within about a thousand years, they became the largest cultural group in West Africa, south of River Niger? How did it happen? And I couldn't find any other way to explain that, other than looking at their social organization. That it's not because they have superior technology or superior intelligence than other people. It's just the way they organize themselves. And that organization is Ile. Ile, Ile can mean a house. In fact, literally it means a house, but it's, it's, it's a corporation. It's like a corporate group, a corporate community, a people that subscribe to the same ideas about, about, about origins, the same idea about divinity, despite their internal differences, they, they may come from different places. So, and Ile is itself is a cosmopolitan space. It's like a, what we call lineage in, in anthropology, but the word lineage is too restricted. That's why I prefer the, the word the Yoruba themselves would call Ile. Ile. Ile means a big house, a big corporate group. So that is the, that is the of their social organization, of their social political organization. In the house, and this is my last quick question about this, but uh, so a, a cultural and practical system that's flexible and adaptable to change, right? Oh, yes. That's why it has to survive for yes. such a long time. Yes, it is. It is. But, but anywhere the Yoruba went, they, they brought that concept with them, right? So let's say in Brazil, you have Ile. In Cuba, you have Ile. You, uh, people always uh, want to understand how come that these people, they were not the largest of the enslaved Africans. I mean, well, about half of them arrived in the 19th century in the, in the Americas. So they came 
they came in large numbers, very late, you know, in, in concentrated groups in Brazil, in Cuba. So people always ask the question, how come that their cultural influence seems to be in higher proportion than their numbers? And I say that there's no magic in that answer. The answer is right before us and it's their organization that they created wherever they went around the concept of healing. So which allowed them to bring in even non-Yoruba speaking from other parts of Africa, even uh, Spaniards were members of it, you know? So, so, so Portuguese were part of it so that it, they were able to create a social network for people of common interest, even from different backgrounds. So, but that has been going on on, on the African side since about 300 BC. And that is the same thing they use to, 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 to expand. Then the second sociological concept that I use here is Ilu. Ilu is the city or Ilu is the town. Ilu is the kingdom. Ilu is an agglomeration of Ile. It is the, it is the supra corporate group constituting a different Ile. So Ile, each Ile is like an asset a portfolio within a kingdom. Each Ile is autonomous, but with the development of Ilu, that is the, the kingdom or the city-state, Ile gives some powers to the central political power, which is, which is the king, right? And I talk about how that came about in the book. Then I also say that the, the, the third one is, is Oba, the concept of divine kingship. You know, that's very important as well. And the fourth one is gender, that, that we cannot understand Yoruba history without understanding their, their conceptualization of gender. Uh, again, some of the issues that preoccupy us today in, uh, in uh, anthropological, sociological studies about the idea of gender. So, so, so that, that, that these four things, we need to pay attention to them when we talk about Yoruba history. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and that does kind of uh, feed into our next question about gender and the gender duality in Europe and within this Europe social order that you're talking about. Um, can you uh, describe for us a little bit some of the origins and transformations of how gender is conceptualized and operationalized within mm -hmm. this uh, Europe community of practice? Thank you. Um, in the, in, the, in the early part of Yoruba history, going back to 300 BC, and this, this, this applies also to other Niger Congo. Yoruba language belongs to uh, a language family we call Niger Congo, right? Mm. Many peoples in that language family, they were matriarchal. They were, you know, uh, they were female center. Of course, over time, uh, as political centralization happened, social complexity, they kind of, uh, they became more and more, uh, I won't say patriarchal, but I would say they became more patricentric or they, be, they began to use both matricentric and patricentric. Now, in the early phase of Yoruba history, especially between 300 BC all the way going to about uh, 500 AD, a woman, will not leave her father's house when she's going to get married. It's, it, it's much looker. The, the suitor will have to come into the woman's family. Okay? Which means the children belongs to the woman's family, not to the man. And it means the man can be kicked out any time. <laughs> If the matrix, if, if the matrix centric family feels that it's, it's up to no good anymore, they can kick him out. And he will have to return to his own matrilinear home. These arrangements allow women to do two things. They can control their reproduction and the product of their reproduction. They can also control the, the material products of that production so that and and this explains why west african women control the market up to today <laughs> because they can use the surplus 
generated within the home to, to trade with other people. Now, as the Yoruba began to build, now began to build kingdoms, military became something, I mean, militarism became more and more important. Then you begin to see uh, the, the male factor becoming more important, right? And then you begin to see the dilution of that matricentric uh, 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 way of organizing society. But, if, but despite that, the Yoruba believe that you need, you need both the female energy and the male energy to create a coherent world. That, that you cannot neglect one or the other. You need both. So what you see in the, in the my concept of gender duality there is the, the that th these two spheres are always competing. You know, they are always competing and they have to compete in order to create a healthy society. But the Yoruba feels that that competition is good, but the competition should not dissolve into conflict. Mm -hmm. That the two must be must be in co in, in, in coexistence. And that and that is why all the Yoruba, you know, social, um, religious, epistemological, philosophical, uh, even political, is always about duality. Duality of two genders. Even when the genders are metaphoric or symbolic, they tend to look at the world in terms of fe the female energy and the male energy. One is not superior to the other. They are co-dependent. And they cannot exist. Each cannot, one cannot exist without the other. So that is the Yoruba idea of gender duality: is that the, is, is 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 the is to create an harmony, an inter, uh, uh, interdependency of the two. But at the same time, the Yoruba believe that every person, every individual, has gender duality in him or her. So I am I am a biological male, but there's feminine in me. As well as masculine, and I cannot succeed in life if all I want to do is extol the masculine in me. I need to bring my femininity here. And likewise, Crystal has both energies in her. <laughs> As a biological uh, female, she has the masculinity. So we, I think the Yoruba philosophy is way ahead of Western discourse of gender. <laughs> that, that there's always in every person both energies are there and you need to, to manage both in order to become successful in life. You cannot just say, oh, I, I want to be just masculine. I want to be male only. No, no, no. That's not the say my, 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 my patron deity is Ogun. You know, if all I use is Ogun energy, I'm not going to, yeah, I will conquer the world. I will bet I will not be satisfied. So there's also a in me <laughs> that I also have to take care of <laughs> all the time. So I need to make sure that my Ogun and Oshun are both well connected to one another. They must always communicate. So our kings in Yoruba, for example, when we, uh, when we greet them, we greet them as Baba, Yeye, Father, and Mother, because they, they, they embody both energies. So a king that does not embody the Baba, the father, and the mother is no king. He, he or she must encompass uh, 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 both energy. So that is the concept of uh, gender duality. And there is a particular uh, sphere of, 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 uh, of uh, political and religious uh, uh, institution among the Yoruba called Oboni. Oboni is like a, it's like a, a what do you call fraternity, uh, a fraternity of elders. That fraternity embodies this principle of gender duality, which I talk elaborately in the book. It's about social, it's committed to social justice, it's committed to the well being of the, of the citizens. It is outside the political sphere, but it's, it's, it is an underground intellectual space for conflicts that, that you resolve from political arena to be resolved without degenerating into crisis. So Uboni embodies gender duality. It, it, it extols the power 
of the feminine as well as the power of the masculine. But both must always be in conversation in order not to let the conflicts that happens in the political arena to dissolve into 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 uh, uh, crisis. <laughs> And uh, there's also another sphere where that of the Orishas, the deities mm -hmm. in uh, the Yoruba community of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, when we look at what Orishas became more important or gained more followers or more prestige in specific periods, we see that uh, at the time when the warrior kings and when militarism is gaining importance in the 16th century, Ogun uh, gains prestige, right? But for example, in the 18th century, in the 1700s, when there is a response to uh, patrilocal power, Oshun uh, also becomes an Orisha with prestige because it's a bit of a, a trying to balance the yes. masculine influence uh, yes. that had been gained by uh, militarism in the previous times, right? Oh, yes, yes. In fact, uh, you know, uh, the Yoruba live their philosophy. You know, philosophy to the Yoruba is practical philosophy. They theorize, clearly, they theorize, but they also use that theory in their everyday practice. And that's why it's a great point for me to write this book because I realized that when you pay attention to practice, you realize that people actually embody they, their history. They, in, in, in festivals, in rituals, in sacrifice, in the mythology of the, de of the deities, all of these are embodiments of this gender duality. So, in my, you know, in my work, you know, in Osogo, for example, I, I did a lot of work with uh, Osun, in Osun Grove, with, with the priestesses of Osun. And that's why, you know, as you said, I realized that Osun deity gained more power, or let me say influence, in the 17th century as a counter, a demonic discourse towards Oyo Empire, which was represented by Shango. Shango and the empire was encroaching on, on the frontier. So Osun became the rallying point for the anti-imperial resistance. And, but, but again, uh, uh, societies are very fascinating. Uh, the, the Oyo intellectuals, they created elaborate myth. How Shango married Osun. Basically, they say that, well, you resisted, but we conquered you. <laughs> because, so they use the idiom of marriage to kind of uh, create a balance so that you don't have to fight with your husband. <laughs> so your husband stop being your, your, your opponent. So, and the, uh, so you, you see in, in Yoruba mythology and always is the struggle to create this kind of balance whenever there is, is, uh, is a political uh, when they sense that there will be a political crisis, then they use mythology to legitimize political con conquest. But in the ritual field of Osun, it's not just a female space. Yeah, female or uh, women dominated it, they, they control it, but there are men within the, the Osun ritual field because Osun ritual field belongs to the anti-imperial people, right? People in the frontiers of the empire. So the, the same thing with Yemaja, what we call Yemaya in, in Cuba. Yemaya is the same thing. Oyo was, was expanding into, 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 into the, front, the western frontier of the Yoruba, which was dominated by Yemaya. So Yemaya became the, 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 uh, another female center deity to counter Oyo hegemony. So you, you see all of these uh, throughout Yoruba mythology throughout the practice and the rituals, gender duality is very central. So to understand Yoruba history, you need to pay attention to that concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, I, I, I was looking for the right term to, 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 so I created that term as a way of, of, of explaining the meaning of gender in Yoruba uh, sociology. In the last, in the last, uh, 
addition about this before we, we talk about something else, but uh, when conducting research in Cuba or in Brazil, to me it was always very surprising when I discovered this at the beginning that for people who practice candomblé in Brazil or Santeria or Regla de Ocha in Cuba or Lucumí, they also call it like that, um, and it exists in other countries as well, it's a religious system or a religion that is tolerant towards uh, a plurality of sexual orientations. So mm -hmm. for example, uh, a, a, a person who is a gay can be a very privileged and important practitioner mm -hmm. uh, of uh, the religion of the Orishas there, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a religion that's very tolerant towards uh, it, diversity in sexual orientation. It, it is, uh, and, uh, and that is another, uh, that's a, uh, a senior colleague and a good friend of mine, uh, Randy Maturi, who has talked about this, sex and the empire that is no more. But it's also because, you know, being a male, be, being a biological male, doesn't mean that you are a social male. You can also be a social female. Mm -hmm. And this is where practice in Oyo Empire, whereby there are, there are social, I mean, there are biological men who were eunuchs. Mm -hmm. Okay? And eunuchs were seen as social female at times. Not always, at times, they are seen as social, social female because they, uh, they, they did not, I mean, of course, these are usually people of Savile background, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they could not, they serve the state. That is, I mean, they were, you know, they were created to serve the state. They cannot create their own home of, on their own. They can, they can, they can lead a house they can be the head of a house on behalf of the state, but they cannot create their own family. So you can see how these were being translated when people arrive in the diaspora, right? How, how because people are familiar with all of these concepts. So uh, it's not surprising, therefore, that in the Americas, Orisha does not, uh, now, uh, unfortunately, uh, in, on the Nigerian side, because of uh, influence of uh, Europeans, our conception of some of these things have changed or are changing. But when you dig down, you realize that this was a society that was very open mm -hmm. to, to, to plurality of, of identities, yes. sexual and otherwise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So we're we're coming to the to the uh, to the end of our talk today, but um, and this has been so fascinating, um, and I wanted to kind of touch a little bit back on your your methodology. Um, you talked about marrying history and uh, and and, and archaeology, um, but you also rely on, like you said, linguistics and oral histories. Um, how does that? How are you able to maybe use some of these? Um, institutions, these existing institutions within Yoruba society to uh, kind of tap into this epistemology and this long-term history, you know, reaching back 1,200 years into the past? Mm. Thank you for that question. Um, the Yoruba belongs to the category of living history. That is, live, they embody their deep history. And when you think of that kind of society, we need to pay attention to their institutions, the institutions that they have created. The memory that the Yoruba have about, even sometimes going back to about, as you said, like 1,200 years back, even 1,500 years back, it's always surprising that how, how possible that people would even have writing who have that kind of memory. Uh, but let me, there, there's the book, uh, by uh, Jan Van Sina, mm -hmm. uh, one of the leading scholars in Africa, African historiography about oral tradition as history. Now, this book is like a Bible <laughs> for many of us who do this kind of work about how to critically assess oral traditions and, 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 and the same way we evaluate archival written sources, 
how to collect other traditions and how to evaluate it for historical possibility. So uh, being trained in that kind of, uh, of field, it's easy for me to, I mean, it's not always easy, but it's possible for me to see temples in Nigeria or among the Yoruba temples and shrines and festivals as archival sources. They are archives. And people who are the who are the intellectuals, the priests and priestesses of those places, they are intellectuals. They 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 embody the the history of those archives. So I I interview them. Uh, sometimes it's not one time interview. That you know usually it takes many years of going back. So you build relationship with them. They don't tell you everything at once. Sometimes I would just visit them and just sit for hours, just talking. Sometimes uh, their clients will come in and the kind of conversation they are having with their clients, I realized that they are historical data that I can use. So but for them to allow me to sit through those kind of interactions, it means that they have confidence in me. It means that they've accepted me as a friend. So you build relationships. And you just sit there and just and just watch what they are doing for hours. Now, towards the end of the day or in the evening when we are drinking uh, a or you know some 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 wine, I can then say, by the way, something happened earlier in the day, and I and I saw you saying this. Can you please elaborate on it? And you know they will elaborate. So that building relations. So doing this kind of research is not a kind of a one-off. Oh, I just go and talk. Yeah, they will tell you anything you want to hear. But it will not be the real thing. So, th so that is how oral traditions work. It is not oral. Oral history is different from oral tradition. Oral history is is what happened in the experience of the person. Here we are talking about traditions that happened before them, and it requires me to talk to different people. I don't do group interviews. That, I don't no. I don't do that. I talk to one person at a time, and then I go around. And sometimes women, women will be sitting there and, and looking at you as if, you know, but then I realize these women have a lot of information that even the men don't have. So I have to build relationship with women as well, who are priestess or who are just, you know, wives in their, see, a Yoruba woman is a wife in her husband's house, but she's, she's a male in a, it's a social male in her father's house. Mm. And, and this goes back to the idea of gender duality. So a, 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 a Yoruba woman uh, is always a male, a social male in her father's house, in her next house. And, and when she's done with her husband, she can always return to her father's house where she will always have an apartment, always. And she, she has the, the authority to inherit from her parents. No one can disinherit a woman in Yoruba culture. No, you cannot. <laughs> so, so, so these women, therefore, they are repositories of knowledge in both their husband, in both their father's house as well as their husband's house. So they are always very important to talk to. So then I, I use festivals. I look at how people move along the, on the landscape. Their movement itself is like a transcript of history because it gives me indications about where to excavate. Because when they go to a particular place, what they say in those places mm -hmm. tells me, okay, that place might have some historical value. That's how, that's what structured my excavation, for example, in Osun Grove. It is by looking at how these priestesses, how they manage the landscape, what they, how they work, where they go to, what they say in particular places. That's how I just, oh, this must be an important place to excavate. You see, so I use all of these materials because when talking about Yoruba history, we don't come across written materials until the, until until the late May. Well, we see some European travelers' accounts on the coast, but that doesn't apply to the mainland where most of the people live. It's only in uh, 1829 that we begin to see European travelers' accounts in the interior. So those accounts are very 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 small. So we need other kinds of 
materials to, to, to write this kind of uh, history. And that's why I always say that, you know, in, in, in Black studies, we need to train students in this kind of a multidisciplinary approaches of, of history because we need more Black students doing African history as well, because it's very important. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's been recent books like yours and like and the uh, yeah. book about the Igbo yeah. that make absolutely fascinating, uh, give an absolutely fascinating treatment to sources of information because the way you can use oral sources in West Africa is truly unrivaled in my opinion. Mm. I mean, you will find that in some places, but the degree of complexity and profundity yeah. they have uh, is, 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 is totally beyond mind-blowing. You know, that of Africa. You are right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> bueno, and um, well, of course, uh, we have to start uh, closing the interview, arriving to its end, even though hopefully this is the beginning of a big conversation about the book and not its end, right? Yeah. Uh, but we would like to uh, make you just a couple really quick questions, a couple of short questions. Uh, your book, uh, The Yoruba a New History, it could also, uh, so it is a history of the Yoruba, Yoruba uh, but it can also be used, I think, in at least two or three more alternative ways. I would like to ask you about them really quick and, and see what you think about these alternative conceptions of the book. The first one, uh, so for example, can we see the book and will it satisfy the people who, uh, I mean, it provides much more than that, but will it be satisfactory for, for example, for people who are looking for a history of the Oyo empire? Yes, yes. I, I weave this actually book around two major, empires in, in Yoruba history. Ife Empire from about 1200 to 1420 and Oyo Empire from uh, 1570 to 1830. So the book is, is woven around this because these are the two dominant political entities around which other parts of Yoruba radiated. So they, they played uh, a very big role in Yoruba history. So, so I, I now in future I plan to write a an entire book on Oyo Empire itself. After all, I'm doing a research on that now. But for now, many students of Oyo Empire will be able to see how the empire developed and how and, and, and how it tried and also eventually came to an end. So you will, yeah, well, I'll see, of course. Yeah, you will focus more exclusively on the Oyo and their leading figures and yes. main events, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. And one more, I know that this is conceptually a little complex. We gotta tell the audience and ourselves, but still I think it's worth thinking about it for a minute, which is that by the end of the book, you tell us that we could conceive of the history of the Yoruba as the switch from a period in which uh, for the Yoruba, what mattered was and what structured society was knowledge capital. And then once Atlanticization or the influence of the Atlantic becomes stronger, or it, this, this is all, that period becomes a history of merchant capital in a way. Mm -hmm. yes. Tell us about this briefly, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, the book can be seen as operating on two conceptual frameworks. One is knowledge capital. And that, that, that lasted from 300 BC all the way to uh, about uh, 1420 as well. So the idea of knowledge capital actually revolved around a city in Yoruba that, that we refer to as the Mecca of the Yoruba people. That is the, the, the spiritual home of the Yoruba and that is Ileife. Ileife is where the ideas, the classical ideas of what it means to be Yoruba developed between 1100 and 1300. That's where the, what it means to be Yoruba. And that, what it means is that Ileife created a set of, of, of knowledge 
a set of knowledge. For example, we are all familiar with Wakanda, right? You know, Black Panther. You know, I have been telling people that, you know, what, uh, Black Panther movie is, a, is Afrofuturism mm. about how an African society managed its resources, its technology, and became great. So now, in Africa, we have many kingdoms like that. And Ilefe was one of them. And this is why Ilefe created a new technology of glass, glass manufacture. Glass beads, yes. which was Which was unprecedented in African history. And that glass, they turn it, they use it to manufacture beads, which were the objects of power, you know, objects of authority, objects of legitimacy for kings, for, for, for priests, for priestesses. And they use that technology to finance their external commerce so that they were trading these beads as far as Mali Empire, even the old Ghana Empire, and they were using them to, find, to bring in silk from the, from the Mediterranean, copper and, uh, and, and brass and bronze. So I call, in my book, I call it the first case of technological nationalism in African history whereby you use not, not natural resources, but you convert abundant natural resources, which is granite. They were making glass from granite. The only place we know in the world that make glass from granite. They were converting a very abundant natural resource into something that has value, something that is not, you cannot duplicate, and that is glass. So, and then Ilef also reorganized the Yoruba cosmology. They standardized the, the religious order. So many of the deities that were already existing before 1100, like Ifa, Ogun, they, they synthesized them and turned them into, into body of, of knowledge, of, of, of learning. They created schools of learning in Ilef so that people were traveling from uh, across the region to go and learn about this new Orisha. So the Orisha was not just uh, 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 gods and goddesses. They were intellectual projects. They were schools of thought, mm -hmm. right? So, so that period, uh, unfortunately, ended around 1420 uh, because of many other factors which I discussed in chapter four of the book, which I don't want to go into that detail here. Uh, and then at, at, around that same period, uh, shortly after that, uh, the Portuguese, then the Dutch began to appear on the coast, and then the Atlantic slave trade started uh, by the end of the 16th century. So that instead of using your own locally produced goods to finance wealth, accumulation, we began to see a practice whereby foreign products were being used as to finance wealth and human cargo. People became the commodity for that. So I call that period a uh, period of merchant capitalism. And I, I think I devoted four chapters in the book. I mean, I devoted three chapters in the book to, to actually four, sorry, four chapters. <laughs> I devoted four chapters, chapter six, seven, chapter six, seven, eight, and nine. I devoted that to, to explore the, the beginning and the impact of merchant capitalism on Yoruba culture and Yoruba political history. So, so that's when tobacco. See, many of us have been, have been arguing for many years of these historians, how, why Africans sold slaves or sold Africans? In my book, in chapter, in chapter six and seven, I talk about addiction. That the entire project of, of Atlantic, of early modern or uh, merchant, or merchant capitalism thrived on addict, addictive products. Tobacco was the main commodity that was used to finance Atlantic slave trade in the Battle of Benin. Mm. It was addictive. It was an addictive commodity. Mm -hmm. The same way that in Central Africa, it was alcohol. Mm. Uh -huh. You know, that powered uh, a slave trade there. So we can come up with all kinds of elegant narratives, but we need to focus also on the addictive component of capitalism that not only financed uh, a trade in Africa, but I talk about Britain, how Britain basically became liquidated, almost liquidated because of addiction to what? 
to tea. to tea <laughs> and 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 how to use opium to balance the trade right I mean, so so we as we talk about the beginning of capitalism we need to pay attention to addictive commodities in australia the same thing you know tobacco played a big role there mm -hmm. so so mm -hmm. tobacco was the main thing that sucked the birth of benin into mm -hmm. the atlantic uh, uh, slave trade so i so and i see tobacco i see alcohol i see calories as part of this merchant capitalism mm -hmm. absolutely sugar is another and sugar idea. yeah sugar too yeah sugar alcohol i mean you know yeah exactly yeah, exactly yeah. bueno my colleague dr Edins and i uh would like to thank you for this we would like to finish with a poem by a nigerian poet that in a way tells us when well, no, a fragment of a poem the poem itself is larger but a fragment uh, from a poem by um, Adeshina Aladeshawe who in 2018 composed a poem and we would like to read just a fragment of it uh, that also shows very well how the cornerstones and some of the historical figures and some of the deities in Yoruba culture continue in the present to inspire people who participate in Yoruba culture and beyond. Mm. Mr. Aladeshawe tells us, I am from the Ifa legendary clan, the descendants of Oduduwa, that great servant of Olodumare. I am from the great Sasere dynasty, men of pride and loyalty. I am from the proud households of great lords that stand only for the truth, great warriors who fought for just cause, the stubborn, impregnable optimists. I am from the heart, the heart of men loyal to Ifa, the great deity whose prayers Olodumare never fails to answer. I am from the womb of the great woman who defied science and fought cancer head on bravely for years, though lost the battle, opened up hope for others fighting the same battles. Mm -hmm. I am from broken bones and crumbling gold. I am Adeshina, the son of Aladeshawe from the ancient Yoruba land of Owo. Thank you very much, Akin, for being today with us. And for those of you who are, you know, really interested in continuing this conversation, you know, obviously this, uh, the book that Akin has recently produced is generating, is going to be contributing to several lines of conversations around uh, micro social action, mass social transformations, the uh, pre-colonial um, era, as well as the, the rise of merchant capitalism that he discusses and, and its global impact. So, you know, again, thank you so much and be on the lookout for those of you in the audience for the uh, fifth annual LEGO Studies Association from June um, 22nd to June 26, 2021, uh, the annual conference, as well as the uh, special issue of Yoruba Studies Journal, which will again focus on Dr. Agundaran's new book, The Yoruba, A New History. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Stronger.